preaches the message today. Uh, we also have our special announcements. Uh, we have our annual potluck and business meeting Sunday, January 28th after the morning service. Uh, if you can't bring anything, we do ask that you come anyway. Um, we love to have fellowship with everyone after the service on that day. Uh, the other reminders are there in the bulletin uh, that you can read for yourself. Are there any other special announcements? No. All right, then I will read the call to worship today, which is Psalm 150, verses 1 to 6. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And I'll pray. Father God, we do come before you today at the end of the year to praise you. As this psalm shows, we pray that we would be able to praise you in many different ways uh, as we praise you through song, through fellowship, and through the message. We pray that you would be with us today, that our worship would be pleasing to you, and that you would take away any sins or distractions that might keep us from uh, fully communing with you and with each other. We pray that you would open up our hearts, our minds, and our ears, Lord, to hear your word, to understand it, and to do it. We pray that you would bless us through the message, and that we would take what we learn today with us throughout the rest of this new year, that we would be lights in this valley for those who need you, Lord, and that you would help us to be faithful uh, until your return. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
I guess. Okay. Hey, Ann. Caught me by surprise. Huh? Who's speaking today? Yeah. <laughs> Let me move this out of the way. Might be in the way for the PowerPoint, maybe. Thank you for not releasing everybody else to go home. Okay. Think this is going to work, guys? There we go. Whoop. Worked a little too fast. There we go. <clears throat> Seems like the uh, only time I get to come over here, of course, that's my fault. I could come over more often, I guess, is when your pastor is sick. So uh, I don't know how to, how to look at that. I'm glad to be here, but uh, I don't want your pastor to be, to be sick. Um, you know, you, you folks apparently are pretty good at praying for sick people. I notice every time I come, uh, you do have a number of folks you pray for. And uh, I've been told that you were praying for me after my most recent adventure in, um, in cardiology. And the Lord was pleased to answer your prayers and get me back on my feet again. And um, I'm thankful for that. And I trust even after you hear me preach today, you'll be thankful for that too. All right, so I want to talk to you uh, about... Not 1809, but I'll ramp up to it by talking to you about 1809. Now, that is not the year I was born, believe it or not. That is not my birth date. But that was quite a year, as I have learned. 1809, the international scene was pretty, pretty active at that point. Uh, Napoleon was, at that point, sweeping through Austria. Blood was flowing uh, freely in, in Europe at that time. Nobody, I suppose, gave a lot of extra thought. Of course, if it's your family, you think about the babies who are being born. But uh, there were some significant births that took place in 1809. For example, William Gladstone, not a terribly familiar name in this country, but he was destined to become one of England's finest statesmen of all time. Uh, he was born that year. That, that same year, uh, Alfred Tennyson was born to an obscure minister and his wife. Uh, he was to become uh, one of the literary world's great ones, Alfred Lord Tennyson. Uh, in America, Oliver Wendell Holmes was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts the, that same year. Not far away, Edgar Allan Poe was born that very same year. He began his eventful, short, and tragic life. Also the same year, a little baby that they named Charles was born into the Darwin family. Certainly made quite an impact in the world, you might say. Uh, that same year, a newborn infant was born in a rugged log cabin in Hardin County, Kentucky. And um, they named him Abraham. He was born into the Lincoln family. So you see what I mean? 1809, quite a bumper crop of uh, famous ones to be born that particular year. Now... I don't, I don't think any of those births made headlines in any newspaper at all. If they had headlines in newspapers in that day, I don't know what newspapers looked like at that time. 
but uh, they were probably, they would have been talking about Napoleon. He would have been the, the big news of the day. But history was being shaped in the cradles of America and England. Now, similarly, uh, I suppose in the first century, on the night that Jesus was born, the news would not be baby born in stable. <laughs> the news probably would have been deadline approaching for taxes. Be sure to uh, go to the appointed place to pay your taxes. That was the big news of that particular time of the year in that part of the world. But yet, this young Jewish woman cradled the biggest news of all time on that night, the birth of the Savior himself, the incarnation of God in flesh. No bigger event could ever happen. And yet, except for a few people, unnoticed. It took time for the babies that we mentioned in 1809 to come of age and emerge as the leaders that they were. It took time for Jesus to, to mature. And today, uh, we are still singing a few songs about Bethlehem. I noticed we sang one today. Thank you very much. Tomorrow's a very, very sad day. We take down our Christmas tree tomorrow. I mean, the, the, that, that to me is a sad I love Christmas. I, 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 I'm, I'm so thankful for YouTube. I can listen to Christmas music if I want to in July and August, and I do sometimes. I, that, that's how crazy I am about Christmas. But I, I, I know that you know that after the events that took place in the little town of Bethlehem, that uh, young family of three now had to make their way back north to the little town of Nazareth. Now, we, 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 don't, we don't sing songs about old little town of Nazareth. And by the way, Paul, I don't know what that picture is. I found online uh, under Google Pictures for Nazareth that one, so I put it up there. Now, Paul knows everything about Israel. He knows exactly where the photographer was standing who took that picture. I'm sure he can tell you the name of the street and the address of it, probably. But uh, is it close? Is it close to Nazareth? Good. At least they got that part right. I would hate to think that I missed it by too far. Uh, good to have authorities on, on hand when you need them here. By the way, if you need a good uh, tour guide for Israel, when things calm down just a little bit over there and Paul gets his, uh, his stuff in order over there, I might want to get over there and take a nice tour with him. Now, Nazareth, the place from which Jesus' mother came, the place where Jesus grew up, uh, it, it was, in fact, in that day, what you might call kind of an insignificant agricultural village, not far from a major trade route that ran all the way to uh, Egypt. Uh, it's not even mentioned by Josephus that, I've, that I could find or in any rabbinical writings. So it really wasn't the, the real the real place that you might think of. We think of Nazareth, whoa, that's one of the big places in, in Scripture. Well, it, it became important because that's where Jesus grew up. Not surprisingly, uh, Jesus' origins in Nazareth were held up to scorn by some people because it was like a no-count place. In John 1.46, Nathaniel said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? You gotta be from a pretty low down town 
to say it. Nobody ever mounted to anything that came from a place like that. <laughs> oh, well, but that was the case. That was the case. The, the village appears to have had a population of never more than maybe 1,600 to, to 2,000. Some places think it never got over about 150 in, in the first century. Just not a very big place, no matter how you look at it. Not much has been discovered there. Paul and I were talking before the service today. If you want to see a lot of archaeology, you're not going to see a lot of archaeology uh, that has been uncovered and on display uh, in Nazareth, but it's still a good place to visit. But it was the place chosen of God where our Lord would grow and emerge as Israel's Messiah. And I, I trust that as we look at his, his growth as a young boy, since that's what happens after babies are born, normally they grow into young children and, and mature. And after Christmas, it seems to be a good time to think about that in, in his life. I trust that we will get to know him more personally, more intimately, uh, in a way that uh, truly our relationship with him would be strengthened and our devotion to him would become not only a New Year's resolution, but a constant commitment that we what would have more strongly than ever before. Yes. It was a place that we could say is a place of uh, his maturity taking place, where he matured from infancy on into a young boy and, and, and beyond. And yes, he had a good foundation there in Nazareth. He truly did. Uh, verse number 39. You know, you ought to have a rear view mirror. It would be backwards, but at least I could see what's going on over my shoulder. Are we looking at a Bible verse now? Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. So when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city of Nazareth. From the momentous events of the Nativity, uh, in Bethlehem, they returned to Nazareth and Galilee, about 65 miles or so north of Jerusalem where Jesus grew up. Now, he was raised by parents. I say he had a great foundation. Get this, just underscore this. He was raised by human parents who performed all things according to the law of the Lord. What kind of a foundation is that, huh? That's amazing. To, whether it's Jesus or anybody else, to have that kind of a family foundation. How many, how many families these days could it be said that that is the case? Not many. Not many. I dare say, even among good church-going people, how many good church-going people could it be said of us that we perform all things according to the law or the word of, of the Lord. But yet, that is what is expected of us. In Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 32, what I, whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it, nor take away from it. That has always been God's standard, doing everything according to his word, everything. It shouldn't be that we go rushing off to the Bible in desperation when we, we just have to have something from God right now. Oh, I'm having this crisis in my life. Everything we do should be in conformity to the word of God. By the way, do, do you have a good reading plan for this coming year? Where are you going to be starting tomorrow in your, in your Bible reading for, for this next year? I hope you have something all lined out and ready to go. Um, I, th I think uh, this next year, 
I will be doing a chronological reading through the Word of God. Um, last couple of years, I've switched, uh, changed out a little bit uh, from one uh, translation to another, and I've done the one-year Bible thing, where you have a little reading in uh, the Old Testament. Uh, you also have Psalms and Proverbs, a New Testament reading there as well. That's kind of nice. So you don't get stuck in Deuteronomy for uh, a week and a half and wonder, when am I ever going to get through this? You can also be getting some good stuff from the, from the Psalms that might uh, nurture your soul. A little more obviously, though, Deuteronomy is the word. But Jesus quoted more from the book of Deuteronomy than any other book uh, that we see in the New Testament. Did you know that? That's amazing. Maybe that'll uh, help us all get through Deuteronomy this next year when we hit that book. We need to know what the Word of God says so we can do it. And you know, the greatest motivation, if you have young children who are at that age where they're learning how to read and developing the reading skills, I always tried to tell my kids, you know, the reason why you need to learn to read and read as well as you can is so you can understand God's Word. That's the most important thing, is to know how to read well so you can read the Word of God and understand it. Uh, and of course, Jesus being Jesus, you would expect this. But also, looking at this, this aspect of his home life, where he was raised in a home where they were serious about doing the things of God, is it surprising when Jesus showed up uh, where John the Baptist was to baptize him? In Matthew chapter 3, verse 15, Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to what? Fulfill all righteousness. Not simply to not do something that is forbidden, but may it be our goal this, this year to not leave anything undone that needs to be done, to fulfill all righteousness in our lives for this coming year. So he's well-founded. Does it say he was also well-fitted? Thank you. And verses 40... In 52, I hope. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. Well founded, but it was working. It was working. It, it fitted him, it outfitted him, if you will. Humanly speaking, in for, for the work that he had to do, this very special work, but this is something we all should aspire to, that we're growing and developing and becoming more equipped all the time to please God and fulfill his will for our lives. Luke notes that he became strong in spirit. Reminds me something of Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, to become stronger and stronger and stronger. Did that happen in 2023? Can you see? This is not bragging. This is not being arrogant. But can you objectively just say, well, yeah, you know, this past year, by the grace of God, I was able to learn this, see victory in this part of my life, there's been, by the grace of God, yeah, there has been some growth. I don't take any credit for it, but yes, the Lord has been at work in my life. It's also stated that he was filled with wisdom, something that Luke mentions here twice. Now, since he was full of wisdom, why is it that we fail to bow to his wisdom in all things, at all times? Do we really think that our way is better than his? The more conformed to the will and the way of Christ that we can be, 
the smarter we are. Now, do you like being dumb? I, I don't like being dumb. I, I, I am dumb quite often, kind of foolish and stupid by the way I, I can do things. But the more like Christ we are, the, the more we can avoid being stupid and dumb. We can be wise. You remember the parable from Matthew 7, beginning in verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell. And then the Lloyd Larkin mistranslation here, and it was a big mess. And the fall of it was great. We can really make a royal mess of our lives in 2024 by not being conformed intentionally, deliberately, consistently to Christ-likeness. Now, we can argue. We can dig in our heels. And, and yeah, it's likely that God will allow us to get away with foolishness seemingly get away with it, but there's always a price to pay for foolishness. Now, I don't know what that would be. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not fishing here. But the whole thing about choosing a life's mate, sometimes that can get to be such a heart thing that I, I, I don't care what you say, I, 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 I am going, I'm going to go with this person. I, I am, I'm really going to marry this person. And you know, I know, it's maybe not the best thing, but I think I can change them. And we can do foolish things and live to regret it. Or maybe be so foolish that we don't even know enough to regret it and ruin our whole lives and not even know we're doing it. Isn't that better to be wise? He was full of wisdom. And so we would be wise to submit to him, wouldn't we? While his body was developing, and he was growing in stature. He went from here to here. I don't know if they put slash marks on, on, the, on the doorpost or not. Oh, look at that. Jesus used to be here last year. Look at that. That's three inches in one year. Wow. Man, this kid's really growing. But he was, he was growing also being fitted for the work that God had for him to do. Who knows what God is equipping us to do in the years ahead. So we better learn our lessons well now, right? It's important to take care of our health physically. But Matthew 4.4, 4, it is written, <clears throat> man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And he was also well favored. Yes, well favored. The second half of those same two verses. The grace of God was upon him. Jesus increased in favor with God and men. He he received divine blessing and enablement in his life. Well, aren't you glad that that is something that the Lord bestows upon his people as well? 
in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, usually you think about this, is the great missionary incentive verse. As we read there that you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Well, yeah, the Holy Spirit enables us to do that. But do you think maybe the Holy Spirit's enabling us to do other things as well? To live for him? To serve him in other ways? To make tough decisions? And I trust that we care about God's favor in our lives. I trust that that is something that, that drives us, that motivates us. You remember 2 Timothy 2.15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Now that doesn't mean simply that we know how to properly understand the word of God. That means we understand it and put it into practice in our lives. So that we're not going to be ashamed. Have you ever been ashamed before God? Just say, I am so sorry. How did I? I, I really messed up. I am so sorry. Here's, the, here's another, another more searching question. Have you ever been ashamed before you you got busted? It's easy to be ashamed once you're busted, you know. I think verse 40, what's going on here? I am echoing. Try that again. Maybe turn it down a little bit. I think verse 40 probably speaks of his early childhood. In the sequence of the, of the passage, it looks like verse 52 may refer more to him when he's older, like maybe 12 years old, something like that. Uh, Luke is doing the writing here. You recall Luke was the guy who said, you know, I've looked into these things. I've done my study. I've done my research. I've talked to people. I kind of wonder, did Luke sit down? Did, did he spend a few days with Mary? Say, so, you know, can you tell me what it was like? Mary would have some things to say, wouldn't she? She would have some perspective. And so Luke would say, well, I can't, I can't write it all down, but I can tell you one thing from what you said. I can see he really, he really made great progress. And that was interesting, what you said about what happened when he was seven or eight. Don't you wonder what happened when he was seven or eight? I guess that we have to wait for that. So he continued to grow. He increased, it says. Um, meaning to, to make one ways, one's way forward. To increase in every way, spiritually, mentally, physically. We too are growing. At least we should. Second Peter 3.18 Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. I have a lot of memories about this real estate here. 1971, my wonderful wife Marty and I moved to Sandy, Utah. Look in this little, little white house over here. With our six month old son and our cat named Dingaling. Cat earned that name. I like cats. But the best we could come up with for that cat was dingling. 
Uh, we were young. We knew a few things, but we were immature. Illustration, immature. So we noticed there was a little extra space out there next to the house. So I grabbed a, a shovel. We, we, we arrived in, in May, not, not too late to put in some gardens. So you see, we, we thought, I want to do that. We got permission from Wesley and Joe answered, could we dig up some ground there? It wasn't our, our, our land. I said, sure, go ahead. So I turned over some dirt. And I'm thinking, wow, I'd like some tomatoes. Immature. So I went down to the store, probably Walmart. No, not then. It would be Kmart. Pardon me. There weren't any walls in there. were just Ks in front of the big stores. Went to, K to Kmart. So I bought a little packet of tomato seeds. Hmm. You want tomatoes? You, you plant tomato seeds, right? So I just dumped the tomato seeds in the dirt. Nice line of tomato seeds. And I started to water that. You say, well, you're supposed to buy tomato plants. I didn't know that. Too young, too uninformed. I like to eat tomatoes, but I had never grown any before, obviously. And the tomato plants started coming up through the dirt. I had a whole line of tomato plants, about half an inch apart, whole row of them. Oh, well, we were too close together. I had, I had more tomatoes. I'll tell you what, the Lord overruled my stupidity, and I had lots of good tomatoes, right from seed coming out of the dirt. Since then, I've had a rough time even making the plants grow sometimes. I've learned a little bit about growing gardens, a little bit more about life, but it's a process, isn't it? This business about walking with the Lord, living for him, growing and growing things. Now, what we're talking about is that it happens. People notice. It's evident to other people as well. In increasing in favor with God and men. We're to be the light of the world by what we do, by what we say, how we act, maybe even more so, how we react to things. A biblical growing church is well populated by people who have obvious integrity. different than a lot of people around them. Acts 2, verse 46. So, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Maybe that's one of the reasons why God blessed them is that they were people of integrity before uh, a dark world in which they lived. All right, so let's move on. Point two, only got nine points today, so we're not gonna be here too much longer. Don't believe everything you hear. All right, point two, should say a place of mastery. Yes, a place of mastery. So uh, it's obvious that in the life of young Jesus, as he was growing up physically, that he was the master. We know that. But he was the master of all of those things that he needed to master to be who he was and what he was to do. It was a place where his coming of age proved that he really was mastering the skills that were necessary. For instance, as seen at a feast, in the passage to read is beginning in verse number 41. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. 
And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it, but supposing him to have been uh, in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they did a U-turn and went back to Jerusalem and tried to find him. That's what they did. Twelve years old. At the age of 12, he understood his mission on earth. He truly did. Uh, this realization was ever before him as he came of age in Nazareth. Uh, he had mastered the concept of being all that his heavenly father wanted him to be. Now, we cannot know everything that Jesus could know. <laughs> He's Jesus, and we're not. But we can at least know this, that we are to do everything that God intends us to do. And we should master that concept so that we understand, even as Paul said, you are not your own. You are bought at a price. It's not up to us to decide what we're going to do this next year, where we're going to go, and what we're going to do when we get there. That's not our decision to make. Have we mastered that concept? Wherever it is, whatever it is, I will take sides with God against myself, if need be, to get that done. Uh, as was their custom, as we read here, Mary and Joseph went every year to Jerusalem to observe the feast of Passover. One day, a Passover was followed by the seven-day feast of unleavened bread. Uh, this entire eight-day festival is sometimes just together called Passover. Now, you know, the background of that you may or may not be aware of. The first Passover is when the angel of death passed over the homes of the Israelites who were enslaved in Egypt many hundreds of years before this, which had been daubed with blood uh, on their lintel and and the death angel killed the firstborn of homes in Egypt without blood on the, on the doorposts. It passed over those where the blood appeared. By the way, in another kind of Passover thing, when God parted the Red Sea, the Israelites passed over to dry land to safety and freedom on the other side. But that's not what we usually think of when we think of Passover. And by the way, Christ, later on, when he was crucified, was crucified when? Passover. Not a coincidence. In fact, Christ is our Passover, it says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Because of his shed blood applied to our lives, the death angel, as it were, passes over us. And we live eternally with the Lord. I believe that Jesus understood that at the age of 12. He was in Jerusalem knowing full well what was going to happen a few years down the line on another Passover celebration when he would become the Passover lamb. He had work to do in preparation for that. 
So he was in Jerusalem on Passover while his parents were heading home. His parents did not realize that he had stayed behind, but they figured it out, so they went back to find him. So they went back, and what they saw was something quite fascinating. Very fascinating. The verses that we want to look at in this case will be verses 46 and onward. Now, so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished. They were fascinated at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. Everybody's amazed at Jesus. 12-year-old kids don't do this kind of thing, right? The three days, I think, uh, refer to the time since they had originally left the city. I think they were one day's uh, travel, heading back toward Nazareth. They, dis they discovered, we don't know where Jesus is. So they had to turn around. That's another day getting back to Jerusalem. Then it would appear, once they got back into town, the next day they were able to locate him. Three days. He's interacting with the teachers of the law. Listening, asking very intelligent questions. Everyone's astonished. Beside themselves in amazement. His understanding, his answers. They were just fascinated. Amazed. Somebody has said maybe another translation there could be they were struck out of their senses. They could not really relate to this. They knew some things about Jesus. They had been told that before his birth. They were told some things at his birth. Certainly they had witnessed things during his development at home. All that they saw, we don't know. But what they saw at this point just blew them away. It's really happening. Maybe that's what came to their mind. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. We should have expected this. Now, how fascinated are we at Jesus? What would it take for us to be Amazed again, all over again, at how amazing he is. When's the last time you were just truly blown away by how great Jesus is? Have we gotten kind of easy with Jesus? Just a little casual, a little careless, a little cavalier. Listen to what Paul says in Colossians chapter 2. In Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. Shame on us. If we get more excited about football than we do about Jesus. Or anything more than Jesus. How could it be? Well, it's easy. We live in a world. <laughs> and we get our eyes on the world. That's how it happens. Shame on us. 
Jesus is so much greater than all of that. Now, this section of, of the passage uh, where he is seen in total mastery of everything that, that he was and would become, yeah, he was focused. He was focused. And verse 48 his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why? Why? Did you see? Keep in mind, the question was based upon their anxiety concerning him. Basically, why would you be anxious, looking for me anxious, anxiously? You need some confidence in me, Mom. <laughs> you really do. Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But it, then it says, I don't know that I understand this. But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Maybe it's just that he's so much greater than we are it will always be hard for us to totally understand, right? That was his focus. In John chapter 8 and verse 29, later on he said, I always do those things that please him. Now our goal is to be Christ-like. So, is that our life verse? Would we dare to claim this as a life verse? I always do those things that please him. I think we would say, with God's help, wouldn't we? By God's grace. But that must be our commitment over shooting way too low. No exceptions here. We can't cut ourselves any slack. Last, last thought or two here as we wrap this up. Nazareth, a place of maturity, a place of mastery, but also a place of uh, meekness. With his family, he went down with them and came to Nazareth. I'll just say this. If you were to see Mary and Joseph and the 12-year-old boy walking on, on the dusty road heading back to Nazareth. If you didn't know them and if you didn't know him, you'd say, well, there's just another family of three on, on their way to somewhere. Now that's meekness. Jesus had a place within that family. At this point, I think there were more than just three, though. You know, he had brothers and sisters. We don't know how many sisters. We know how many brothers. Family. Yeah, it's special, but at the same time, family life is regular life. It's day-by-day -day life. Jesus was meek enough to take his place within a family and of course, that elevates the greatness of a family to think that Jesus would think it's important for him to find a place in a family. He was, in that family, one who knew how to follow leadership. As a matter of fact, it says he was subject to them. Wow, you talk about meekness. Now, who should be subject to who in that situation, right? You, 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 can, you can work this through in your own mind, trying to figure out how that worked. But remember, he was in a godly family, so I don't think he had choices to make. He was subject to them. Uh, you know, we get old enough, we're no longer subject to our parents as adult children. 
but there should always be respect and honor. Always. And in all of this, in his meekness, he became the object of Mary's faith because it says in verse 51 his mother kept all these things uh, in her heart. All right, so that's our message for today. You gave me a little extra time, so I took it. So I hope that's not too torturing. But Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Um, in, in Nazareth he grew. For us, it's wherever we live that we are to grow and progress. Wherever we are, we are to be maturing. We are to be mastering our divinely appointed mission. We are to meekly be submitting to God and, and to man. The message of Bethlehem is the birth of the Savior. The message of Nazareth is going on with him in victory and in growth. Some of you are old enough to recognize this name. Some of you don't care. That's all right. Roger Staubach. Who was Roger Staubach? Glad you asked. Who was Roger Staubach? Turns out that Roger Staubach led the Dallas Cowboys, and I'm not necessarily there, but he led the Dallas Cowboys uh, to a world's championship in 1971, the very year that we moved to Utah. He admitted that his position as a quarterback who didn't get to call his own signals was the source of real trial for him. There he is with Tom Landry, the famed coach of the Dallas Cowboys at that time. Coach Landry sent in every play. Now, that would, that would take the wind out of your sails, I suppose, if you're a high and mighty quarterback. He told Roger when to pass, when to run, and only in emergency situations could he change the play, and he better be right if he did. And even though Roger considered Coach Landry to have a genius mind when it came to football, uh, Roger Staubach said that pride got in his way when it came to submitting to his coach like that at all times. He had a rough time with it. But later, Roger said, I faced up to the issue of, ob of obedience. Once I learned to obey, there was harmony, fulfillment, and victory. Ah, and that's where we end. Right there, at that point, and hopefully... The Holy Spirit will apply to our hearts those things that he sees that we need by way of putting this message into practice, into shoe leather, as we uh, say goodbye to 2023 and face a whole new opportunity to serve him with the uh, ringing end of a new year. Let's stand together and be dismissed in a word of prayer. My good friend and tour guide, Paul Karpenko, you've been to Nazareth lots of times. Please uh, pray with us as we leave our, our, our message, our place today.
but to look forward to how we can serve you in this new year to come. Bless us, Father, in all that we do, that we might further the gospel, Father, in everything that we say and in everything that we do. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a happy, blessed New Year. Oh!